My name is Liz Rosenberg, and I'm the director of the Energy, Environment, and Security Program at CNAS. And I'm joined here with the co-chairs of our task force on unconventional uh, energy and U.S. national security that CNAS convened a year ago to look at some of the more pressing geopolitical considerations associated with the unconventional or shale energy boom in the United States. Uh, and thank you to, uh, our, to Richard and to Tom Donilon for framing this topic for us so well in the first session. So our task force co-chairs are distinguished by many more honors than I have time to enumerate right now, but I'll introduce them briefly. Senator John Warner, uh, who uh, is an advisor and fellow at the Pew Charitable Trusts and senior advisor at Hogan Lovells. He served for 30 years, as we heard in the United States Senate, as the chair and the ranking member of the Armed Services Committee, and uh, also, of course, as the Secretary of the Navy. Governor Bill Richardson was a two-term governor from New Mexico, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Secretary of Energy, and a 15-year congressman from New Mexico. He is also the founder of the Richardson Center for Global Engagement. And Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, who was a former Undersecretary of State for Global Affairs, and for eight years was the head of delegation for climate change. Uh, she is the chair of the World Affairs Councils of America and senior fellow at the Harvard University JFK School of Government Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. So in this session, we'll start with some brief remarks from our co-chairs. I'll offer uh, a couple of the key policy recommendations from the report itself, and then we'll move to a question and answer session with the audience. So we'll start first with Ambassador Dobransky. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. And first, I'd like to thank the Center for uh, 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 National, uh, uh, CNAS, <laughs> the Center for National Security Affairs, and its president, uh, Richard Fontaine, for your vision. Uh, also, Liz Rosenberg for her penmanship, her superb penmanship, and also the privilege of being able to serve uh, with uh, such a distinguished uh, to some of co-chairs here, uh, the governor and the senator. Also, I'd like to underscore the fact that we had really a terrific task force itself that was quite diverse. We had energy experts, environmental experts, academics, former government officials, business types, and also representatives of the military. And I, I think that the debates and discussions that we had going into this report were really just uh, stellar and very, very uh, timely. I'd like to, in my time, highlight uh, three uh, core points relevant to energy diplomacy that were underscored in the report and that I think we all embraced. And then take a few minutes and maybe underscore some of the points uh, that the former National Security Advisor Tom Donilon uh, had said because uh, this whole issue is quite important for national security. And he mentioned some areas and I'd like to add a bit to why it's important. But let me mention the three key areas. First, the CNAS report on the, this you know, energy boom, I think an energy rush, and alert to policymakers, and also truly a call to action uh, in dealing with what really constitutes a very changed energy uh, landscape. And what I think was significant in the report for policymakers, it details quite readily the opportunities and the challenges. Uh, it also underscores that despite this energy windfall for the United States, that uh, the, the fact that our global economies are interconnected and that we are inextricably linked to the global uh, oil trading system and energy trading system and its price fluctuations, that the fact is that despite this changed landscape for us, we're not going to be immune. In other words, for those that think that we are protected uh, and immune from these developments abroad, I think we are kidding ourselves. And this report certainly goes into that. And in turn, I think it basically also underscores the core point, which falls there from, that we cannot disengage politically uh, from our energy partners. And we can best promote, in fact, well supplied uh, uh, or well, uh, promote energy security by advocating for a stable, uh, well supplied energy market. Here, leadership matters, engagement matters, and the area of free trade and free trade agreements matter. Um, let me mention the, the third. So the first was the alert 
The second was the importance of um, uh, here of uh, engagement and our interconnectedness. And then the third, I think, core point that came out in this report was also truly the importance of the delineation of a new global energy um, order. The rise of the demand in Asia, uh, Tom Donilon spoke about the different types of trading patterns uh, that are taking place. And in this sense, I think the report calls for uh, the importance of strategizing, of stepping back and looking at these confluence of developments and what ramifications it has for our overall diplomatic architecture and statecraft and how we strategize. Let me mention a few broad points about why all of this uh, matters. The first is, is something that, uh, again, I think Tom Donilon, his first point was, which I have to agree completely with, is truly the importance of the econo economy and how here it, these developments are essential for a strong uh, economy, which is the foundation, as we know, of a strong uh, defense and also an engaged foreign policy. I'm very much reminded of the former uh, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen, when he was asked what, in your opinion, is the number one strategic threat, he pointed out the economy and how crucial eco the economy, economic developments matter greatly for our national security. The second point here is as the U.S. becomes a major energy supplier, I think that as was pointed out, we will consequently acquire tremendous political leverage, and we're already witnessing that vis-a-vis -vis our allies and also our foes. I'll give a different example from the case of Iran, one that comes readily to my mind and actually is referenced in the report, and that is the uh, issue of Russia's supplies to Europe and looking at the prospect of U.S. engagement in that arena and what the ramifications are. It certainly it does undercut uh, Russian leverage. Uh, it also can have a positive impact by also bringing down their prices. But also, I think as we see the developments in Ukraine playing afoot, and where this is used as a leverage and an instrument to impact uh, developments there, that's something that we will be, I think, more and more we will see part of. So this issue of political leverage is key. A third point is that diplomatically, these developments also afford us some new opportunities of engagement and collaboration. A look into the context of our own neighborhood, uh, Mexico and Canada. Just in recent days, the developments in Mexico are rather significant in terms of Mexican legislators liberalizing, coming forward and liberalizing foreign direct investment in oil and gas. That's a groundbreaking uh, development. It has great consequences for the United States and for our region. And then let me also mention, there was a question from the audience about diversity. I think one of the points that's been very much underscored in this report is the importance of diversity and having a sense of perspective that with this windfall, it has benefits to us, but also we need to be cognizant of the importance of a diversified energy approach, of looking at all of the different tracks from renewables, energy efficiency, coal, nuclear, and so forth. And then finally, let me just say that here I think one of the diplomatic points that I think really came through this report and was referred a bit by uh, Richard in his uh, comments, and that is how do we deal with political perceptions or apprehensions by countries in different parts of the world. I happened to be at a young political organizations leader that happened to be in Turkey. And I had a, a Saudi businessman come up to me and say, what does this mean in terms of energy independence in the United States? Does this mean that you're cutting off from us? Well, the words that you heard from our former national security advisor, I think is one that we embrace in this report, and that is, you know, there are a variety of strategic interests that we have, taking just the region of the Middle East, looking at other areas diplomatically, and you can't divorce them. And in that sense, I think this report also brings out, in a diplomatic sense, the need for maybe revisiting our terminology 
and looking at how we advance, but at the same time, we balance our approach. Let me leave it there and just thank again CNAS. I'll just go for the acronym instead of uh, stumbling over the whole phrase, but CNAS for really having the vision uh, for uh, looking at this issue and its consequences. I'm very pleased to be here. Well, thank you. And I too, with, uh, with Paula Dobransky and, and, and Senator Warner uh, and, and CNAS doing this great work, my hope is that the U.S. government at this very moment is doing a study like this because the change in energy perspective and energy policy demands uh, an assessment, a reassessment of our national security policy with respect to energy, which I believe has put a lot of new issues on the table. Shale gas. Uh, Liz and, and, and Richard have wanted me to talk a little bit about shale gas. I'm a governor of an oil and gas state, although we've had a lot of renewable energy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, let me just be very clear about what I think has happened. When I was Energy Secretary 12 years ago, and thankfully we had Senator Warner as chairman of the Armed Services Committee who cared about energy, and he bailed me out of a lot of problems. Um, I used to go around the world to OPEC countries saying, please, please increase production so the price goes down. I used to get criticized for that. Uh, at the time, the price of oil when I became energy secretary was $10 a barrel. The, 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 oil patch, the oil patch was in terrible trouble, Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico. We had no energy policy. You know, renewables was, people were thinking about it. We, we, we didn't, and, and over the next few years, the big cry politically, let's have a comprehensive energy policy, which never really happened. But what did happen? American technology, a guy named Mitchell in Texas developed hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, maybe not him alone. But the shale gas boom started, more production of oil and natural gas. And what did that cause? In my judgment, shale gas has been good for this country because one, it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. It does. Uh, the statistics vary, uh, but it significantly does. Number two, it creates jobs. Uh, I've seen a study of up to 2.1 million jobs. Uh, it, it, it helps our economy, exports. I think you could see a number of countries around the world very interested uh, in what the shale gas explosion means for us and for them. But what I think is essential is that we look at what is the downside? The downside is what is the effect going to be on climate change? That there is an effect. And so we have to balance our energy policy and recognize that while we develop shale gas, let us not forget the other advances that have happened in American energy in the last few years. A lot of it citizens, counties, cities, states, not necessarily just the government. But the fuel standards of the president helped enormously. Uh, the development of renewable energy, solar and wind, especially right now, they're, they're moving in a very positive direction. Uh, the energy efficiency that communities, schools do, uh, all of that combined with shale gas has possibly made us the major producer of oil and natural gas and maybe on the path to energy self-sufficiency, everybody says 2020, 2025, whatever, but it's put us in a very comfortable position on energy. And a good part of this has been shale gas. So, so what do we do with all this? Number one, I think it's important that as, as Paula mentioned, we, we be smart in our diplomacy about our energy relationships. Immediately it's gonna mean, I think, transfer of technology to countries with shale gas reserves like Argentina, Mexico, and China. I think there's enormous potential there. Number two, uh, Paula also mentioned this, uh, with Russia. You go to Ukraine, you go to the former Soviet republics, they all are very unhappy with Russia playing political games with natural gas. So they want to get less uh, dependent. They want to develop LNG terminals. You go to Asia, Japan uh, uh, and, and countries like Korea, uh, desperate to find alternatives. Shale gas, Fukushima in Japan, uh, having problems. 
uh, you move into parts of the Middle East, and this is where I think we have to be careful. Uh, the Gulf Corp or the GCC states, Saudi Arabia, these are very important to us. You know, one of the good things of this shale gas boom is OPEC's influence has diminished. It has diminished. And that's good to a certain point. I mean, let's stop like thumping our chest, say, hey, Saudis, OPEC, Nigeria, Venezuela, uh, Algeria, all these OPEC countries, we don't need you anymore. We, we gotta be careful. We shouldn't do that. I think we have to be smart, especially with the Saudis. This is a very valuable ally. Uh, not j and they're jumpy because of what we're doing with Iran. They're jumpy because of the oil, the shale gas issue, uh, the Middle East. Uh, so, so we gotta, you know, these relationships are very important. I'm glad the president is going there. The only good side there that I see is Israel, by the way, is developing some real new natural gas reserves. You're going to see Israel become a player in natural gas, and the issue there is who wants to work with Israel. I hope American technology uh, plays a part in these new developments. Let me close with, uh, with this statement. The big debate in the United States on shale gas is hydraulic f fracturing, is fracking. I mean, I, I spoke in... in, in about six months ago in New York, and, and, and some of the fracking people, they, they didn't like what I said, which I said, I think shale gas can happen, and we should develop it, but we should be careful and environmentally sensitive about fracking. You would have thought I'd come out, you know, in favor of, of Judas. They were so unhappy. They wanted me to say, you know, that you were the greenest governor when you were growing. I, I was, by the way. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't say that. So I think it's important that American technology uh, and, and the oil and gas companies, they realize, look, this shale gas could be a real strategic opportunity for America, for you. Do the science on hydraulic fracturing. Listen to what EPA is saying about disclosing chemicals and water and methane. Let's do this right. Let's not say, oh, you know, no regulations because uh, we don't need that. You just, government is getting in the way. Let's do it right. States are doing it right. So Colorado, others, uh, EPA. Let, let's do the science right on shale gas because I think it's a real opportunity for us. The last point I will make, this is, I've made several last points. But my, my last point, because I want to hear Senator Warner. This is a national treasure, and I want to hear him. Um, Mexico. Something really important is happening there. You know, everybody, oh, you know, Mexico, violence, uh, the cartels, and never immigration, never is going to move. This new president there has gotten significant education, fiscal uh, reforms, uh, a pact of all the parties working together, but most significantly energy reform, which means partnerships in not just oil and gas, but offshore drilling, renewable energy, uh, biofuels, biodiesel, and this is our neighbor, and it's happening. And you know, the, 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 the Mexicans are having, they just made a deal with Luke Oil, uh, with the Russians, they're going to be significant players. And I think it's important that in politics, the first thing you do is don't forget your base. Your base, the United States base, is Latin America. We forget about Latin America. You know, we, every president, I love President Obama, but, you know, I, I want a little more Latin America. I want him to go there. Like he's going to the Middle East, because I think what's happening in Mexico what's happening in, 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 in Brazil, what's happening in Argentina, and I think conversely, in a bad, in what's happening in Venezuela, requires that attention. Canada, my last point. This is an important <laughs> country that we always forget. We forget the Canadians. They're our biggest producer, energy producer. They're our biggest partner. We never mention them. Uh, all kinds of energy. Anyway, shale gas is good but let's do it right. Let's do it with environmental sensitivity on fracking. Uh, I think it's important that the president get fast track authority so that we can have this shale technology relationships with Europe, with Asia. It'll be a lot easier with free trade and fast track, 
But if that doesn't happen, you know, this whole boom is going to slow down. I'm up. It's up to you. Are you finished? <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed uh, my days in the Congress because we, we had a lot of fun together. And when you were secretary, I did grind on you pretty hard. But you weathered the storm beautifully. Your long suit is modesty, my dear fellow, modesty. <laughs> and may I say to our distinguished ambassador here, who was sort of the leavening in as we debated on this, but I want to thank the senior members of CNAS for originating this report and having us participate. And I want to thank each of you for coming. But as I sat here tonight, as I have in this very room many, many times for forums. I reflected on the growth in the nation's capital of organizations like CNAS. When I first started, it was in the Navy Department, and we had two or three organizations. We relied on them a great deal because they were able to formulate policies without having to clear their draft here and there and do it and do it in a very forthright manner. So I want to thank many of you in the audience who are now engaged uh, as we are at CNAS, as I am at Pew and Bill and others at other organizations. But the growth here in our nation's capital of this type of nonprofit organization to come forward with valued policy decisions is helpful to the president, it's helpful to the Congress, and it's a growing rapid industry. Now to our report. You and I remember, it was I think in the 79-80 of the oil embargoes. And the halls of the Congress, I'd only been there 18 months, the halls of the Congress were jammed with people taking their frustration out on us because the gas lines at the gas pump. And I learned a lesson early on that gas pump and the prices and the impact on our economy and the families that rely on that gas pump is essential. Now we come along to this shale boom. I, I don't associate myself with the boom word. I like to think that we should, as we were taught in the Navy when I was a 17-year-old sailor, steady as she goes firm hand on the tiller. The wind is going to shift on you, but trim those sails as you go. So we should accept this wonderful advancement in technology, as all three of us have joined here, with a degree of modesty, and don't practice in-your-face politics in the international community, and particularly as it relates to the national security. The sea lanes of the world are the arteries by which our energy flows. The air lanes, the trade, and it's up to the armed forces of the United States working together in partnership with the other nations to keep the measure of safety that's vital to the success of the transfer of goods, the transfer of energy, and trade and commerce and our own personal safety. And a number of those countries that are full partners in maintaining that safety are ones that we purchased our energy from for years. And so now we let's, in a more graceful way, cut back, strive for greater energy strength, maintain our diversity of sources. We haven't talked much about the bio industry and so forth. The Pentagon has been in the forefront of innovation in developing the biofuels to show they can work in our aircraft and in our ships and other ground vehicles if necessary. So as a country, we ought to approach the magnificent technical achievements of fracking and do it with a sense of modesty and moderation, but firmness in establishing not necessarily using the word independence. I think the ambassador was correct. 
we ought to drop that. I remember in my closing days in the Congress, it was you could go down and get the local political meetings and drum beat. We're going to be independent of everybody, and it fired them up. But I think now we better reflect with a little sense of moderation, because those people and those countries that we depended on to achieve this new strength of energy are going to be there. And they need our assistance as they shift, as Tom Donlin said, shift the marketplace and absorb what we don't require now for our own domestic needs into their energy base. So let's proceed with caution, steady as she goes, and at the same time further strengthen our diversity of energy sources in this country and move forward because in times of crisis, and this is a troubled world, whether it's cybersecurity now or the overhead surveillance and all kinds of things are coming together to make life have a degree of uncertainty. We should rely on them, perhaps not to purchase their energy in the quantities we once did, but to assist them as they adapt in continuing their level of economy, which many of these nations are just so strongly dependent on the export of energy. Work with them, as each of us have said here tonight, and I think that message is in this report. But lastly, let us do so in a way that we strengthen the whole global community, the whole global economy, because we're all in it as partners. And in this security battle, I want to make sure that our ships can still make a port call. Our ships can refuel if necessary, lacking their own internal fuel system. Our aircraft can do emergency landing. We can go with these nations jointly to help other nations in the time of, of severe weather disasters and other things. We're all in this thing together in this world now. So let's be a little modest about the largesse that we're going to gain and are gaining, will gain from the boom, as you love it. But I think we ought to approach with a little more modern, a little more we're there with you and you're we're still with you. So with that, let's close out and let them have at us. Oh. <laughs> Very good. Well, uh, thank you for your remarks. You've eloquently covered a number of the findings that are in this report. I'm going to pause for just a few more minutes and um, summarize five of the key policy recommendations that are covered in the report. And some of these will sound familiar because we've already heard them in the context of the comments we've had so far in both of our sessions. So the first policy recommendation I want to highlight is one to support well-supplied international energy markets. And policymakers, of course, can accomplish this um, uh, domestically, uh, which is an imperative, of course, but maintaining strong environmental uh, regulations and supporting industry best practices in order to protect groundwater resources and control emissions at the wellhead and also through the production process. And it's also something, this supporting unconventional energy development that, the, that policymakers can and should do abroad with international allies as well, also in an environmentally responsible manner. So the second recommendation I want to highlight is um, for a strategic review of energy market threats. And the administration should conduct such a strategic review of current threats to physical oil supply as well as to US, uh, a review of US strategic and military commitments to guarantee oil transit through key maritime choke points and conflict prone areas. Third, expand international coordination for energy security. The administration should expand collaboration with energy partners abroad to guard against threats to energy infrastructure and supply routes posed by physical and cyber attack and also by conflict and weather-related supply disruptions. And the administration should revise the criteria and the coordinating mechanisms for strategic oil reserves use to better manage supply disruptions and price spikes when they do occur. And in particular, this means improved coordination with major energy consuming countries that are not currently part of the IEA system. Fourth, use less and diversify more. We've heard a bunch about that so far, but essentially this means greater energy efficiency and diversification of energy supply sources, particularly for the transport fleet uh, sector, which is so heavily dependent on uh, petroleum-based fuels, which uh, will make our nation's economy more resilient, um, 
reduce the exposure to uh, oil market disruptions when they occur and, of course, reduce carbon emissions into the environment. And fifth and finally, export energy. And I think Congress and the administration, of course, both have a role in encouraging the facilitation of uh, exports of natural gas and of crude oil, which can stimulate U.S. energy production, contribute to less distorted and better supplied energy markets. So that's the, that's the summary of uh, the report, the task force findings, some of the key policy recommendations. We'll move now to a question and answers, uh, question session, and I'll ask a first question of, uh, of our speakers here. So the environmental and climate change implications of uh, massive new shale energy production capacity are uh, national security considerations for the United States and uh, issues that have animated public discussion political conversation for the last several years. Now, you've all served in positions of uh, top political and national security positions in the U.S. government. If you were advising President Obama today, what are some of the key national security considerations associated with the uh, massive new shale energy resource development that you would highlight for him and suggest that he focus on, in particular, through the remainder of his administration? Start with I will broaden your question if you don't mind, but uh, uh, during our presentations this point was hit upon, and that is TTIP and also the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. I would recommend that the President and our Congress, from their respective uh, positions, move forward uh, in that area because it has direct ramifications for energy, energy barriers, opportunities, so I would start with that one. The second one, I have a second and a third if I can. The second you referred to, but I would broaden it. In the report, uh, it called for a strategic review. I do think that with the changed energy landscape, that it's absolutely essential for the interagency to come together to step back and to not only look at the threats, that was the point highlighted right. in the report, but actually, really, to do an assessment and of what are the opportunities and what are going to be the core challenges and bring in the entire interagency community to do it. I don't know if we have a national security decision directive on this, maybe we do, but it seems to me it's worth stepping back and looking. And then my last would be one that's also in the report, and that is about the um, uh, expanding uh, the energy uh, exports. Uh, again, there's opportunity here. I know there's a debate about this, about how far, how fast, et cetera, uh, what are the ramifications, but I, I think that that's one that I would also put forward. Those are, would be my top three. Okay. I would say technology. I think that is what uh, we have an edge and we should use that technology. I mentioned uh, the shale gas potential producers, Mexico, Argentina, China, transfer of technology of uh, this uh, shale gas technology, uh, number one. Number two, uh, again, emphasizing the importance of strong standards in this country, uh, environmental standards on water, on methane, on, on emissions uh, as part of the fracking debate. You know, the reality is in Europe, you've got countries like Germany, uh, France, Netherlands that said, we, we don't want any fracking periods, don't even talk to us. Uh, there's a glimmer of activity in, in Britain, but, but I think there has to be more uh, dialogue and understanding, and science should be part of the key. This is why I think it's important that the more scientists join this debate, not just uh, on climate change, but on issues like fracking is important. The, the last point, and you know, the president didn't get much credit. He spent quite a bit of time in the State of the Union on energy. And, 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 and he talked about the importance of climate change. You know, I, it's going to be divisive, but I would proceed with these, uh, with these executive orders on climate change, try to get as much done that way. Uh, but more than anything, uh, I think the dysfunction in our Congress, this is why, you know, we need people like John Warner back. In fact, I've should, been there, done that. You go. Uh, no, I, I, but, but you know, we need we need these debates. Uh, and, 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 and on the, I worry about this fast track authority. I remember during NAFTA, 
I was one of the only Democrats at first to support it, but now I worry with this, this opportunity in Europe and Japan and in Asia that we're, because of domestic politics, we're not gonna get this done. These far reaching economic agreements that are important for the global economy. So I, those are all the things that I would say to the president, but he's not gonna listen to me anyway, so. Well, I certainly do. Um, <laughs> I would simply say, first, I, th I commend the President for launching very quietly through executive order this study within the executive branch of the energy policy. That's going to, I think, be very fruitful. I would suggest to him he invite uh, outside commentary on uh, how we perceive the government is operating in that area. And I also would stress that the biggest element of our energy security is energy savings and efficiency. We had this country all revved up about four years ago where everybody was really concentrated on how can we conserve what we have and use it more efficiently. And I don't want to lose the impetus of, of the every street corner, every village, every town trying to be conscious of their usage of energy. I, I want to say the armed forces of the United States really snapped too under the leadership of successfully Secretary Gates and others who said to each of the commanders, show me your plans on your base, your ship to conserve energy. With simple things like turning off the lights and perhaps not running all the air conditioning when everybody's out of the building. All kinds of things came together to put the Pentagon in an energy saving posture because they are the largest single user of energy in the United States or the world for that matter, the consumption of energy by the overall uh, Department of Defense. So don't lose consciousness of the gains we've made in energy by savings and efficiencies. Emphasize that in the, his report and call on others to comment. Great, thank you. So now we have time for some questions from the audience. I see some hands up. Remember, please, just to identify yourself and your affiliation uh, here in the front. Thank you. Hi, Eric Clark. I'm a graduate student at Ohio State University. Um, now, due to the decreased price of a barrel of oil um, and with the uh, potential destabilizing effect of that in energy or in oil um, dependent nations, how would you recommend combating potential effects in regards to security, terrorism, and um, crime in these regions? Well, I'll would lean like forward yeah. here quickly. First, we've seen an increase of cybersecurity trying to impact the grid system, and that's dangerous because as we hopefully are moving more and more towards utilization of the extraordinary complex grid systems we have and the need to have redundancy, and so that should be emphasized. So that's my quick response. We're, we're up to speed on trying to be aware on that. Do your, your major uh, companies engaged in providing electricity all over this country, you'd be surprised how much concentration they're doing now on the question of having security of the transmission lines in the grid system. Well, you know, I, I will also focus on the grid because your answer, I think your question relates to the whole grid system. I remember when I was energy secretary, I made all the utilities mad. I said, America has a third world grid and we've got to modernize it. Uh, it's a lot better now, but I still think it needs improvements to make the grid more efficient, to stop some of these, uh, you know, we, we still have these shortages. Uh, it has to be more efficient in the production of transmission, renewable energy. Uh, I, I just think that uh, we haven't done enough there. John mentioned cybersecurity. I mean, the worst nightmare is, is for hacking on our grid. I mean, imagine if something like that happens and some kind of terrorist connection with our grid system. Um, you know, I, 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 would also, I would also say that uh, I think it's, it's important 
that we allow uh, investments in the grid, that some kind of, I've always felt that in, uh, this is not the time to talk about more spending, but infrastructure spending and modernizing the grid and green technologies uh, and transportation and, and upgrading our overall infrastructure is, is a worthy investment. I'll just add uh, two points, uh, um, starting with the comment about you know, a cyber attack, as the senator mentioned. I think there's one silver lining here that more of our states are now focused on how they adapt their utilities and the grid to the potential, and not only the potential of an attack, but what happens right after an attack its uh, capability and capacity to spring back. Uh, more and more, at least, I've been exposed to on a state-by-state -state basis, uh, many governors, uh, other um, uh, state legislators are focusing on this uh, uh, crucial issue. But I interpreted your question actually more broadly or internationally, and in that sense, I'll, I'll just say I think this point was underscored by something that Tom Donilon said in the question about Nigeria over here. You know, we look at every individual country, there are a variety of relationships that we have and in which they're founded. And you mentioned a number of areas which in the Middle East, in terms of dealing with um, uh, uh, terrorism and counterterrorism issue, regional stability, regional stability matters greatly because a disruption there has consequences for those countries who are getting their energy supplies from the Middle East and a shakeup affects all of us in terms of our global economic interconnectedness. So I think that one has to be very focused, again, that our relationships are multifaceted and we have to be thinking about literally how we bolster them you know, in all these tracks, not just one single track. Okay. Uh, in the back here. Thank you, Ben does here, really, CSIS. Uh, the question that I have for you, um, and I thank you very much for tracing out the geopolitical implications of successful exploitation of our shale gas resources, but it seems that there are some, uh, there are some conditions that must first be met. We need to uh, create the correct technology to A, um, exploit the natural gas uh, in a cost-effective manner, and we also need to find the correct technology to make sure that uh, well production doesn't tail off the way that the report describes it currently does after the first year. Um, could you discuss, A, what needs to be done uh, domestically to make sure that those technologies come online so that the shale gas boom continues and that we're actually able to take advantage of the potential gas resources that we have? And second, uh, could you discuss maybe the geopolitical implications of what might happen if those uh, potential resources can't be exploited if we don't come up with the right technologies? Thank you. Well, maybe I'll just start. So, essentially, price, right? So. Uh, a, su a sufficiently attractive price that will enable uh, E&P companies to get out there and develop the technology and get the resources out of the ground is what it's going to take to keep the technology innovation going. And similarly, if the price falls off, there's not, an, <laughs> there's not the incentive for them to keep doing that. Uh, that's the brief answer. I, 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 does anyone else want to address that? Well, you know, I, I mentioned the whole uh, technology issue relating to, to fracking. Uh, I mentioned the technology issue relating to uh, developing these new technologies uh, for extraction. Uh, look, I think the beginning was the hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, but a lot of new technologies are being developed uh, across the board. Now, uh, one thing that we talked about, I think Tom mentioned it, Natural gas is a bridge fuel, okay? But it's a bridge to what? I mean, no one's answered this. I'm gonna answer it, because and I might, you may not agree. I think it, the, it's a bridge fuel to what will be the dominant source of energy around the world, and that's renewable energy. Now, you know, it's had its problems, renewable energy, but if you look at the United Nations, the 196 countries, whatever they're registered, and, 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 and there's a list. What is your energy future, country X? Uh, a large percentage, 70, 75, are saying renewable energy, maybe even higher. Now, you know, we haven't talked about the nasty things that you don't want to 
really bring out. Everyone talks all of the above, and I think the president's basically right. But you know, there's some fuels that aren't doing well. I don't know if they're gonna recover. One is nuclear. You know, Fukushima dealt a huge blow to nuclear. The good thing about nuclear is that it doesn't emit greenhouse gas emissions. The bad thing is that, you know, there's security concerns. The public is worried about it. We, we haven't resolved the waste issue. John Warner tried to resolve it years ago with a sensible proposal, but we haven't done it. So my point is that, you know, you got to, I think, I think we need to continue the, 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 the support of nuclear, but uh, I think the coal guys also, uh, I'm not encouraged by uh, the development of new coal clean technology. I think it has to be faster. And I think our coal companies need to realize that this is serious, climate change, and they can't continue with the old, you know, I'm glad I'm not running for office anymore. But, you know, they, they, they haven't adapted. So if there are two fuels out there that need revitalizing, refurbishing, you know, get on with the program, it's, it's nuclear and coal. All of the above, the rest, I think, are moving forward. Gas, uh, uh, oil, uh, renewable, uh, biofuels, biodiesel, all of that is, is, is positive. I'm Ben Taggart, uh, State Department. I uh, just have to ask, especially following up after that, cognizant of indirect impacts of climate change and the potential for this to work as a bridge fuel to renewables, as you described, should we be doing that pursuit to the exclusion of following up on revitalizing coal, revitalizing nuclear, uh, even things such as the Keystone Pipeline? Should we really be trying to push those through, or is that counterproductive at this stage in the game? Well, on Keystone, and uh, we did not directly take that as one of our issues, um, I think the president is, is working through this the proper way listening to all of the departments and agencies. And defense hadn't made their commentary, EPA hadn't made theirs. Let's wait till the whole dossier is in on this, uh, in my judgment, before, and then I think the president will consider the full range of opinions across the spectrum of the executive branch and listen to what the states and others have to say. It's a tough question. It's not easy, and, and as the governor pointed out, the environmental concerns have to be weighed very carefully in this instance. Canada is going to go ahead with their market. They're going to find a market and a way to move it out. But at the same time, we ought to be highly conscious of the viewpoints of many others before we try and jump to a decision on the uh, on that pipeline. Now, that's my view. You know, I I, th I think the question you ask is, should we be picking favorites? The answer is we shouldn't, but we always do. I mean, I was on the renewable side years saying, hey, treat renewable the same way we treat oil and gas on tax and other things. I think it's gotten more, uh, more I won't say fairer, but uh, you know, we, we do that. My worry is like we shouldn't go out and say, okay, nuclear, you're gonna get more subsidies, but you gotta do this. I think nuclear uh, needs to, to basically look around the world and see, you know, Fukushima was not good. It wasn't good in Asia, it's not good in Europe. In India, there's, there's a, an agreement we have with India that, that looks that uh, nuclear will, will happen and, and will be viable. But, but I think it's up to the new technologies in, in nuclear and new cost-saving measures. And, and I don't know how you deal with the public, uh, and the perception. I, you know, I, I come from a state that has nuclear waste, and, and I'm, I won't say I'm pro-nuclear. I think it should be part of the mix, but I wouldn't pick it as a favorite, but I think nuclear and coal need to do more to get on the program of these new cleaner technologies. That's what I'm saying. I, may, may I just sure. uh, uh, give my response to that? I, I think something that was underscored in this report is the whole concept of diversity and a diversified approach. Um, maybe I wouldn't say, you know, in picking fa favorites here, but I think when you also look at the concept of energy security, there are also two other elements that go hand in hand. And take Secretary Moniz, I think he's really underscored this, you know, in many of his statements, and not just in his statements, but in terms of the programs that are going forward over at DOE. 
and that is you look at energy security, but you also have to look at environmental stewardship and at the same time, the importance of also economic growth and economic factors. And a lot of times these issues may knock up against one another and they're not always perfect and clear cut solutions here or paths. But I think that, and that's where you end up getting maybe a little bit more emphasis in one area and maybe a little bit in less in another area. But I'll take one, uh, you mentioned the nuclear, let me take a flip side. The DOE just marked uh, the, I believe is the 10th anniversary of the Carbon Sequestration Leadership Forum. And Secretary Moniz was talking about how any, you know, uh, coal-fired plant, there are a number in this country and in which they are applying gasification and EOR, enhanced oil recovery, and looking at ways forward um, that, you know, uh, it's a big investment, but, you know, that's part of the panoply of paths. So my, my own personal vote is, is going back to the whole question of national security and where we are, I think you do have to look at these three factors. And I think that, you know, one path, it's not going to be a panacea. You have to look at all of these. Say a word on this nuclear thing. Uh, that's been an important contribution, about 20% of our overall energy. The United States Navy is highly dependent on safe operation of reactors in our carrier fleets, in our submarine fleets. And men and women now are operating those platforms and the safety record is extraordinarily positive. And they're looking at perhaps miniaturizing, I use that in a small sense, smaller nuclear plants that could be moved in safely to remote communities and give them uh, a bit of freedom from their energy requirements of bringing it in. So let's not bury it. It is a sad tragedy what the Japanese went through, but gracious, how they figured out to put those plants right on the edge of the water is a question that remains unanswered. So it started way back when there, and we would not hopefully ever make that mistake in our country. Well, I'm conscious of the time, and I don't want to keep you all here longer than we've committed to for the agenda today. So I think I will say that I'm grateful to, uh, to our panelists here and to all, indeed all of our speakers tonight for their insights on shale energy and national security. And I would ask you all to help me in closing this event by thanking all of our speakers with a round of applause. Thank you. I really enjoyed it, Thank you. Thank you, you, are wonderful. Thank you very much. You did a grand job. Yeah.